behalf of all of us here in the sanctuary. <clears throat> Welcome to those who are uh, receiving this service through our DVD ministry and others who may have found us on the internet. Uh, this is a service in East Minster United Church in Belleville on the 1st of April, 2012. This is Palm Sunday, and throughout our service, with the help of a wonderful choir and all the folk who are here, we've been singing and shouting hosannas. But for a little while, before we go any further in the service, I'd like to invite you, uh, particularly reflecting on the Palm Sunday story from the Gospels, to reflect on what may be the danger of those hosannas. We know that the conspiracy against Jesus was energized and ultimately resulted in his execution a few days later, not because the religious establishment saw Jesus himself as any kind of threat, but because they were afraid of his growing popularity. They didn't believe that he had in himself the power to, 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 to challenge them. They didn't see in him one who had any kind of supernatural power that would threaten them. What motivated their fear and ultimately their murderous scheming was popular opinion. If Jesus had gone back to Galilee and kept his mouth shut after that Palm Sunday, they probably would have left him alone. What they feared and what finally persuaded them to behave so badly was popular opinion. It's captured in the words of our text. As they watched the crowd follow Jesus, the Pharisees said to one another on that Palm Sunday, look, you can't do anything. The world has gone after him. The world has gone after him. So the beginning of the end was that day we call Palm Sunday, when they saw how, how many of the folk came out to, to meet Jesus, when they heard their shouts of Hosanna, when they realized that Jesus was being welcomed as a kind of conquering hero. Palm branches waved as if, as if he was Caesar, for heaven's sake. Garments thrown in his path as a token of profound respect. Then the Pharisees knew they were in trouble. When they saw that the world had gone after him, they knew what had to be done. They knew then Jesus had to die. Now, we should not be surprised to read in Scripture that popular opinion shaped destinies and changed history in those days. Because even more in our own time, we are always under the influence of popular opinion. Popular opinion. It determines fashion trends. It creates stars and destroys their careers. It wins and loses elections. It shapes public policy. It raises and lowers stock markets. It even molds morality, what, what we think is right and wrong. The world turns in the direction in which the crowds choose to run. The Pharisees knew it. And so when they saw so many running after Jesus, they realized that their world was turning with those crowds. And they knew that they had to do whatever was necessary to stop it. Now it could be argued I think quite easily that the world in which you and I are living is turning faster than ever. Popular opinion has never been more influential. In the past few months we have witnessed the power of the crowd in the so-called Arab Spring. Long-standing and previously invincible regimes have been brought down in, in Tunisia and Egypt and Yemen by ordinary people who got together to stand up, speak out, and demand change. It eventually took military intervention, but it was mostly popular opinion that ended Gaddafi's reign of terror in Libya. Violence continues in Syria, God help them all. But there is no doubt that it's only a matter of time before the crowds bring down President Bashar Assad. On Thursday this week, despite the overwhelming strength and ruthlessness of government forces and his resolve to stand against the world's opinion, Assad finally said that he was willing to begin to negotiate with the rebels because the force of public opinion was growing and becoming ever more a threat. The power of popular opinion has always been particularly influential in matters of faith. From the very beginning of the Christian church, 
It has been shaped by the will of the majority. At first, for instance, all followers of Jesus were Jews, or they were willing to submit to the requirements of that tradition. Uh, for instance, circumcision. But then people like Paul, people like the Apostle Paul, began to mobilize public opinion to force a change by which Gentiles would have equal standing as candidates for discipleship. And think of the big decisions which were, were, are being made in our own churches. Now they may originate, those big decisions, whether it's, it's Maranatha or Eastminster, whether it's in the Christian Reformed Church or in the United Church of Canada, those big decisions may begin with a sense of, of prophetic insight, but they are ultimately made and remade by persuasion. If you get enough people to think the way you do, that swell of public opinion will eventually force change. And that's what makes popular opinion so dangerous. I'm not talking about whether double-breasted suits come back into fashion. I wouldn't complain. I've got some. <laughs> or I'm not talking about who gets voted in as uh, this year's American Idol, although I've already made my choice. <laughs> popular opinion is risky because while it has the power to change how the world turns, popular opinion cannot be trusted. Democracy, well surely democracy is the best form of government because majority rule is the best way we know to make corporate decisions. The alternative is tyranny and whether absolute power is vested in, 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 in an individual or in a few, such a system is always subject to self-serving bias which left unchecked inevitably becomes corruption. The need for majority support is our best hope of choosing and keeping the leaders we need. But, as is so clear in the stories of Holy Week, the will of the majority is terribly and a terribly untrustworthy arbiter of truth. For one thing, the crowds which can turn the world are frighteningly fickle. Look at what happened that week in Jerusalem. Just days after they welcomed Jesus with their shouts of, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The same crowds were shouting for his execution. Crucify him. Crucify him. Our kids and grandkids, they know the fickle forces of peer pressure. You may remember the Byway department stores. We used to call it the black and white boutique. There used to be one across the street in the Bayview Mall. Byway was a discount store, like a small scale Walmart, but with none of the brand names. There was a time where our children would only wear clothing with the right labels. The peer pressure was such that classmates would make fun of anything else. Since money was tight, we didn't have the option of outfitting our six kids in the right branded stuff. So Betty would secretly buy what she could get at Byway and sew in new labels. <laughs> but you knew that, didn't you? You already knew that. Yeah. I'm getting some looks of shock over here. Variations of peer pressure are no less pervasive in the practice of religion. Popular opinion, just think about it, popular opinion about church architecture. If, if Maranatha had been, had been built 30 years ago, it would have looked like a very different space. If Eastminster had been built at a different time, or the, when the building that we did build in, in the 1950s and 60s was a very different space for worship than this one. Church architecture is subject to the, to the fickleness of popular opinion. What we wear to church. There are some of our folks who are wearing things today that probably, we're not, we're not complaining. We're not, I mean, I have to wear this because I'm paid. But, the, but, but, but you know that, that, that some of your parents or grandparents would be appalled to see folks wearing what they wear to church, but we think nothing of it. Public opinion has changed. Public opinion is necessarily fickle. It changes. We change with it. And who cares? Who cares? As long as 
We do not give the fickle forces of popular opinion the final word on things that really matter. In the search for truth, the will of the majority may not be the last word, especially since we're pretty sure that give it a week or a year, the majority is going to change its mind. Another reason why popular opinion is so untrustworthy is how easily it can be manipulated. When they saw their world turning and turning against them, the religious leaders in Jerusalem undertook to manipulate what people thought about Jesus. They convinced some that his teaching was a threat to their tradition. They persuaded others that his claims threatened the pride and possibly even the authority of Rome. You see, it wasn't just the fickleness that caused the crowds to turn against Jesus, their opinions were changed through manipulation. Commentators are suggesting that when he presented his budget this week, Finance Minister Jim Flaherty employed a time-tested device for manipulating public opinion. Because in the weeks before the budget, he had hinted at spending cuts and other measures which would have been far more drastic than those which he actually announced. And he did that in hopes that public reaction would be tempered by relief that in the end it wasn't as bad as we feared. Whether it's negative advertising in politics or a preacher pounding his pulpit, our opinions can be manipulated so that we end up thinking not necessarily what we ought to think, but what we are persuaded to think. But surely the worst danger when the crowd turns the world is that popular opinion does not necessarily and very seldom in reality equal truth and not the whole truth and certainly not the truth of God. Jeff uh, Bethke is what they call a viral video star. He's a Seattle 22-year-old. He's become a YouTube sensation due to the popularity of a poem he wrote and reads on YouTube called, Why I Hate Religion But Love Jesus. In just two months, it was viewed by more than 19 million people. Bethke's influence, especially on young people, is enormous. And that poem begins with these words. He says, Jesus came to abolish religion. Well, that's not true, is it? Jesus himself said that he did not come to destroy the law, the law which was the foundation of his people's faith. What he did say and try to do was to point out how their faith and practices did not necessarily match the will and intentions of God. He said things like, you may think that you were made for the Sabbath, but I'm going to tell you, God ordained the Sabbath for your benefit. When he intervened in the stoning of that woman who was found guilty of adultery, he said, You may all think that you have the right to punish her, but I tell you that the one who is without sin cast the first stone. And in that culture where public opinion valued children only for their potential as future adults who could someday earn something, be worth something, and in the meantime should stay out of the way and mostly quiet, Jesus announced that these little ones have a special and prior claim to the kingdom of God. Again and again, Jesus challenged the assumptions, perceptions, and beliefs of popular opinion. Again and again, he said, that's what everybody else tells you, but I'm going to tell you what's true. And in a scene which is recorded in three of the four Gospels, Jesus asks his disciples what people are saying about him. And when they start to echo the popular gossip, Jesus interrupts them by saying, Okay, but who do you say that I am? And that's what matters, isn't it? That's what matters. As the world turns, it doesn't matter what the writers of all the beautiful music we're hearing today, it doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter, in the end, it doesn't really matter what I say. It certainly doesn't matter what the media says or reports about Holy Week and the cross and what we're going to be celebrating in our places next Sunday. What matters, what matters is what you say. What matters is what you think. What matters is what you believe and what you 
do about it. So, whatever others say, whatever the pressure of the crowd, and it's always going to be there, whichever way the world may be turning, what do you think about the one who comes in the name of the Lord? And what do you believe about the saving power of the cross in your life? And what are you going to do about it? Amen.